So welcome to Thursday, Thursday session, cohort one, week three of PEEP. And today we're talking about building for long-term brooder boxes, coops, and nesting boxes. So well, I just go in order, brooder boxes, essential, especially when you get new chicks. When I say new chicks, so let's like, say, for example, you order online or maybe you order locally. Are there any hatcheries on Kauai? You guys know? So no. We get from Kawamura's and they ship them and we get them when they're like two days old. Okay. So another option is a soggy hatchery. They're hatched for egg laying hens or chicks. Is not as infre as frequent as for broiler chicks. For broiler chicks, they hatch every other week for egg laying hens. I think it's every other month, if I'm not mistaken, or once a month maybe. But mm -hmm. even then, like you gotta pre order because they usually sell out unless there's a cancellation. But anyway, it is whether you get it the day of, the next day, or usually if you buy from the mainland, it's two days really critical that you put them in a brooder box so brooder boxes are basically mimic the mother's hen way of protecting the chicks as you can see in that picture the that one chick is under the chick the hen um i've seen picture actually i've seen hens protecting chicks i thought it was kind of weird it was raining it was under the mango tree where we used to live I was wondering why the hen was <clears throat> still. It was just under the tree. Usually when it rains, they, they go up, you know, to be away from predators or whatever. But obviously the chicks can't fly yet. So it's just there. The wings are a little bit spread out. Not quite spread, spread out, but like just like what you see in the picture. Yeah. And I was like, what's going on here? And it saw me. But it didn't move, so I'm like, oh, I see. And then I saw the chicks, you know, under the wings. So I thought that was pretty cool. So, yeah, so we're just trying to mimic that same environment to protect the chicks. And, yeah. And what can you make or what, what are the essential parts of a brooder box? So basically having a feeder, a water source, a heat source, ventilation in a draft free box these are the essential parts especially if you're ordering them from the mainland um you know it takes a couple of days for them to get here you know the <clears throat> the hatcheries usually put some kind of solution it's like a gel solution to keep the for the chicks to have something but physiologically speaking they have enough in their bodies to last them for two days uh, food wise i mean um <clears throat> without having any water or feed okay so if you can imagine um you know they got hatched they just got hatched they put them in a box um well usually for for laying hen or uh laying for egg laying chicks uh they sex them so there's a couple extra steps there and then they package them and then they send them to their destination. So if you can imagine, you know, the, um, the chicks are stressed, you know, I don't know what part of the plane or whatever that they put them in, even if it's heated maybe. But once they get to the post office, I can assure you the post office is cold in the back, sometimes colder than outside. And I, I have ordered online many times. Every time they, they get to the, the local post office, I get a call at like 5.30 in the morning. And <laughs> they are pleading, saying, your chicks are here. Can you please pick them up right away? Because they're chirping too much. They're making too much noise. And that's an indication that they're hungry, stressed, or they need, or they're too cold. So... So really important, even for a saggy hatchery, when they do send, they usually send the same day of hatch. So 
I would imagine for Kawhi, it's just overnight. But still, you know, they can take they can like I said, they can be okay for a couple of days. But after that, you got to make sure water and feed is in front of them. So, because at that point, you know, they're either stressed or weak, so they need some some type of sustenance. Okay, so let's look at the parts. The first one, the feeder, it needs to match your brew the box size. What I mean by that is, say for example, you're only getting 12 chicks. You know, you don't want to have a brooder box that's too big or too small. You know, make sure that you, you size everything accordingly. And then if you are going to use a feeder, you know, you want to make sure that your feeder is not too big for the space that you're creating for them. I put this picture of a feeder. This is what I use. For our chicks, at least, I like these feeders because they're the trough, which is the bottom part, it has a lip that goes in. And I don't know, you know, what's everybody's experience with chicks. Chicks tend to create a mess. They spill the feed a lot. So that lip actually helps in containing the feed. So they peck in. And, you know, it, it, it kind of helps keep the, the feed from getting out. Let me show you. So this is the feeder that's on the picture. Pretty big. It's I think 12 inches on the bottom from one end to the, the other. So bigger than my head. So, you know, if you're if you only have 12 chicks, then this is overkill. This can take care of. If I'm not mistaken, up to 100 chicks, Peter. And I saw these years ago, and they were on sale for three bucks. So I think I bought like 100 of them or something. Yeah. I so I kind of went nuts buying these. And I only use, well, before I was using about 75 at a time. But now I'm only using 8 or 10 now. So anyway. That's a different story. But yeah, these are really, really good because they're pretty high too. They can't get on top or even the, the trough is pretty high. And there's not much space for the chicks to go in because the other concern with other feeders, which I have right here, this is smaller. It's probably good for 12. But the problem is, I mean, it does have that lip, but it's not as tucked in as the other one. The only issue I have with this is the chicks can nest inside, or maybe not nest, but they can go on top and they can doo-doo around the trough, you know, contaminating the feed. And there's nothing to push them away or there's nothing in the way from for them to, to sit on, on, on the trough area. Whereas with this one, the top part of the feeder you know, it's, it will prevent them from getting in or roosting or or just getting in, really. The only concern with this, well, at least for us, for our operation, because we're using mash feed as opposed to what most feed out there is pelletized, either in crumble or in pellet form. The mash gets tends to get stuck up top. It doesn't go down sometimes, so we got to turn this guy so the mesh goes down. Anyway, if if it gets stuck on top, the chicks would go in and actually stick their head up top like to get the, get the feed. And a lot of times we'll just, you know, when we check the chicks, there's like chicks stuck inside. And we just got to pull them out. It's a minor thing, but, you know, that could be an issue if you're using mesh for any type of feeder really so anyway so that's one of the reasons why i don't i don't i have nothing against these you know you can you guys can use these but that's just my concern with these type of feeders i have a question sure i have kind of seen some diy feeders mm -hmm. made out of plastic pvc rain gutters where the straight comes down and then you know you have that connecting curve at the bottom that right. you can use as a feeder part and then you just kind of tie wire it to the side of the cage. Is that effective or not effective? It's fine. 
it's fine. I think you just gotta make adjustments. Typically, when you're when you have chicks, you want something that is low that they can reach. So I use these type of feeders, like the one on the on the picture on the slide, because the lip is lower compared to other commercially made feeders. So you, it's just a matter of maybe lowering it if it's for chicks, and then adjusting adjusting its height when the the chicks are not chicks anymore; they become pullets or they become yes. So yeah, there's no there's no right way or wrong way. It's just a matter of if it works for you, you know, you can do DIY for sure. Nothing wrong with that. My my only concern is making sure that the feed doesn't get dirty by either the doo-doo or if they're scratching. You know, if it's too low, then, you know, that could be an issue. But yeah, for chicks, you just want it to be lower. Uh, so on the- Asking, why do you mash the feed for the chicks? Oh, I don't mash the feed. Let me explain. So most feed that is sold on the market is pelletized. So basically, I'm just going to use conventional feed as an example. Most conventional feed uh, is is usually with corn, with soy, some oils like soybean oil, canola oil, or... Usually soybean or canola oil is what they use. And then you have vitamin premix, which is less than 2% of the, the ingredients, and, and some enzymes. Enzyme meaning like salt, some minerals, so they add in. But majority of the feed ingredients is either soy or corn, for conventional at least. There might be wheat mid- middlings or wheat mill run, which is the byproduct after they process for wheat. But typically, that's what it is. The vitamin premix is usually vitamins derived from plants. Um, so it just depends on what the nutritional needs are for the particular. If it's for broilers, you know, they will address that accordingly. Or if it's for hens, they address it accordingly. Um, so typically, that's what it is. So they put together all those ingredients, like say in a big mixer, and then what they do is they put it through an extruder or a pelletizer. The reason they do that is for efficiency. When you mix all those ingredients, you know, the, the goal is to homogenize all the ingredients, right? So if, if they're pecking on whichever area of the feeder is, the, the goal is like they're getting everything nutritional wise you know from from the mix so they they pelletize it one for you know homo- to homogenize it and then two for feeding efficiency because it's a lot easier to eat the feed and a lot efficient to eat the feed so easier and efficient to eat the feed when it is in pellet form so for our particular feed, the way we feed our chickens, it's not in pellet form. It's still in that, that mixed form that I mentioned earlier. And they call that mash. So it's not like I'm making a mash out of it. It just the term that they use for that mixture is called a mash because it's not pelletized. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Um, in fact, give me a minute. I'll show you what I mean. All right. Okay. So it's, it's, it's like you can actually see the corn bits. They're, they're still pretty, well, they're not intact. They're, it's like cracked corn. And then, you know, it's like powder, basically. So I, unfortunately, I don't have any pellet, pelletized uh, feed here. Uh, so I can't do a comparison. So, so yeah, you can tell that there's corn here. I mean, I know what soybean look like when it's in after they extract the oil. It's basically, well, it's a mash. Let's see, what can I think when you're, that's a good example. 
anyway, so this is unpelletized feed. This is still in mash form, and this is what I meant. So this is what we feed our chickens. Remember? It's like cornmeal, like corn ground yes, up. Yes, yes, Chunky. yes, yes. That's exactly what it looks like. So when we did our feed trial with Dr. Ja, who's speaking next week, this is what we fed the chickens. And based on the feed trial that we did, we stuck with this. So when I order my feed, I tell the feed producer, this is how I want it. So they don't, they don't take the extra step of pelletizing it, obviously. For me, this work. In fact, Dr. Ja told me it's not going to work. <laughs> anyway, but we've been using this for the past, I don't know, four or five years. This is all, this is all we feed. I, I have, have another question. Sure. What's the difference between mash pellets and scratch? Scratch is, scratch is usually grains that were that they put through a hammer mill. A hammer mill is basically like, is a big grinder. So, so like you can put grains like wheat, oats, corn. So depending on what the scratch ingredients are, typically, I know there's corn at least, and then they put other grains, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So they put all that together and they, they sell it to you in that form. Mash is what I just showed you. And then pellet is, like I said, ingredients that are put together based on the ingredients are based on what you are provide. You know, if you have a hen, if you have a broiler, you know, it, it's just based on what the nutritional needs are. And then they put that together and then they put it on an extruder or a pelletizer. So, yeah, and the size of the pellet will be determined by what is typical for what they feed the, the hens or the chickens or whatever poultry that you're feeding. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so, so the age of the chicken also depends on like what kind of feed, like you wouldn't give a baby chicken scratch, right? Right. Right. Cause they can't process it. So a typical feed for chicks is, is crumbles. So it's it's still pelletized. It still it still go through an extruder. An extruder is just basically a machine that forces the the mix through holes, and so the um, so it comes out according to size. So if if you want a custom blend, and then you tell them like I want a pellet size, or I want like I'll just throw a number. You know, don't quote me on this. Like, say, I want a two millimeter pellet size, and then they will put a a die, a two millimeter die, to the extruder, so that when that feed goes out, it is two millimeter in diameter. You know, um, so again, it just based on what you want. But usually, I think there's a standard. There's a couple sizes. So when you buy your pelleted feed. You know, there there's a certain size, like a uniform size, but you can order it if you are buying custom. So, like I said, usually for chicks, up to two weeks or maybe maybe four weeks, crumble, you know, is is the way to go. There is feed, or you can actually feed even adult hens crumble all their life, and it's fine. Again, it's just for efficiency sake. They are saying that they would, what you call, they would not waste more feed if they had pellets when they're bigger. Um, and, and I can see that. I mean, just from our experience, you know, five years of using the mash feed, you know, some chickens, depending on the, you know, the, the chickens, they can play with the feed pick what they want and then like trash the rest. So you just got to work with it. Some people don't like it. In fact, I don't know if anybody in the whole nation that do mash like what we do, at least consistently. I know there somebody does it, but we, we, we use exclusive mash. In fact, 
one of the nutritionists for Purina is coming in March and they're going to come visit our farm and they're going to talk to us about, you know, whatever our needs are and whatever. So, so that should be interesting. And maybe they'll even ask like, why are you using mash? You know, cause that was always weird. Every time I Purina is like the second or third, no, the fourth, fifth one that I talked to about providing mash and it always, always wonder like why do you want mash you know because not it's it's not a standard anymore so anyway it's probably cost effective too yeah yes on their end uh yes well the the reason why we chose mash is because from the feed trial the birds internal organs to me at least my personal opinion matters more it's a good indicator for me if the bird is healthy or not yeah uh, when we were on pelletized feed the intestines were a little bit different yeah they were a little bit darker there was blotches even on the large Ooh. intestines the size of the gizzards were inconsistent the liver were okay for the most part but when we used the the mash feed the gizzard size were pretty consistent, pretty big, pretty robust because it, before there will be gizzards where they're kind of soft, but now they're all pretty consistent. Tough, tough meaning there's integrity to the, the gizzard. The liver is just is beautiful. <laughs> they're, clean. they're clean. You know, they're very clean. Yeah, and even the hearts, you know, they're pretty consistent in size, so... Just so for meat birds, you, you sell all those as well, yeah? Yes, yes. The gizzards and stuff. So that would be some indication of, yeah, absolutely the health of the bird. Right. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't look at you can't a bird. It by, any, uh, by the meat, yeah? Yeah. I, 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 I don't base it on the appearance of the meat anymore. It's, to me, it's, you know, I'm, I'm more concerned about the inside. In fact, we slaughter for other people, you know? And my sister is the one that do the evis the evisceration, and she she always tells me, ah, these birds stink. I mean, birds <laughs> stink. But when she open it, when she she pulls out the viscera or the guts, there is a distinct smell. And so for her, when she smells that, she knows that okay, these birds were not in an environment that you know. Yeah, maybe it's okay, but, you know, when you have that smell, you know, like, because we have some some way to compare it. So it's, for us, it's like, ah, these birds jump, even though they're not. But, you know, it's like, okay, there's a smell I, I don't like kind of thing. Wow. So anyway, I know that's kind of a little off topic, but. Uh, and when Chris talk about feeding, you know, it's something um, to think about. And maybe ask questions. Okay, where are we? Okay, so I nothing wrong with using these type of feeders. You know, just a suggestion when using these type, make sure to prop them up because these are pretty low, usually body height of the chicks. You know, again, I don't know what your experience are with chicks, but they can actually extend their necks and their body farther than you think. So if they see the feed there, if it's, you know, if it's propped up a little bit, they, they will be able to reach it. So the reason, you know, I suggest you prop them up, you know, put them on a, like a brick or some kind of whatever is so that they don't poop on the feed. Mm. Um, the other reason I, I don't want to say, I, I'm not saying, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't recommend this. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. The other thing is like putting feed in these guys. It's a little cumbersome. And then if it does get pooped on, you know, it, it is a little cumbersome to, to clean because you got to take the whole thing out, take everything out, open it up. And, you know, whereas with, with this type, you know, big open mouth, you know, you just put the feed inside. You should be all right. Okay. It has limitations though. You know, when the when the chicks get to pullet size, 
I suggest you use a hanging feeder as opposed to these. I exclusively I exclusively use these just for checks. Just okay. the first four, three weeks, four weeks even. I've been, I've been looking around for those and I, I haven't found them yet on the internet. What I what I budgeted for is this kind in the on the picture. So, I, but I'm looking around for that other kind so we can have that one instead or something comparable. Sure. Yeah, like I said, nothing wrong with these one. I maybe it's just my personality. Um, nothing wrong with them. They're pretty effective. Maybe because I'm lazy. <laughs> um, hey, Julius has a hundred of them. Yeah. <laughs> Make him an offer. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm thinking about it. We only need 17. Um, <laughs> cleaning, the, cleaning this one when you have 150 chicks in there is not appropriate at all. Like, not okay. Oh, yeah. But, like, for 25, like, yeah, no big deal. Yeah, might, yeah, might not be an issue. But, yeah, like I said, you know, I, I get 600 almost 700 chicks every couple of weeks. So, Ooh. oh yeah, you need them. Yeah. I have to <laughs> use that accordingly. Just joking. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's so, yeah. So, you know, something to consider, like I said, I'm not saying don't use these. It's just, you know, everything has limitations. Okay. All right. Water source again, needs to match your space and the number of chicks. In this picture, this is actually a picture of my, one of my brooder boxes. I got quite a few, like I mentioned, I get almost 700 every couple of weeks. So I got to house them accordingly. I don't know if you can tell that PVC right there has those little red things sticking out from below their nipples. Let me show you a picture, or let me show you. Where did it go? Oh, right here. Annie ordered these for you guys. So it's a PVC T, and then and this nipple attachment. They peck on this, and then it opens the valve. Opens the valve and then the water comes out and then they drink off of it. Sometimes I train the chicks, sometimes I don't. It just depends on my mood, but they always figure it out. They know oh. to peck it and then they figure, oh, water comes out. And then next thing you know, they're all wet and I'm blow drying the chicks. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> it doesn't happen to you. It happens to me every now and then. So... I I will talk about this more, putting this together. When you guys get the parts, I feel like it's a little too soon. I might just confuse you guys. But it is pretty self-explanatory. It's kind of like building Lego parts. Or it's like Lego parts. You just... Or you got to glue them. But, you know. This is kind of what it looks like when it's put together. And then for our setup, it's connected to a... Oops, sorry. PVC, or oh, not PVC, a tote. The, our brooder boxes, are, there's two 27-gallon totes that they're connected to. Again, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm feeding and providing to almost 700 chicks, so I got to have the, um, the enough water um, to provide. Yeah, we got all the stuff for everyone to have six... And a tote and the PVC and all the stuff. And when the time comes, if you feel like it's challenging to put together, I got a guy. Cool. But yeah, I'll go over it too. You know, just to give you guys an idea and maybe, um, yeah, uh, get Annie's guy to, to help out. <laughs> Again, you know, these are on the picture. These are what are usually sold at feed stores. Nothing wrong with these. If you are using one of these, you know, just make sure it's elevated to avoid the chicks getting it stepped on or pooped on. I, I'm i not a big fan of these, although we've used them for a number of years. The only reason I'm not a fan is because if you see the bottle, it's translucent. Algae can grow if it's out in the sun. Um, and then, you know, if it's on the ground, you know, dirt or debris can get kicked on it and can contaminate the water. You know, I was told, you know, water is more important than feed. 
So you got to make sure that you always provide clean water, especially for the chicks. You know, they're at their most vulnerable. So you got to make sure they, you know, they always get clean water. So I got a ton of these too. You know, like I said, we use these. But yeah, it's just cumbersome to clean. My hands are a little bit bigger, so I can't get into the hole. Yeah, I mean, they work. Just make sure they're, they're cleaned if they are dirty or they get pooped on. All right. Let's talk about heat source. You know, I mentioned, you know, you want to mimic, you know, what the mother hen do for the chicks. So when they are under the wings or under the breast area, you know, it's providing heat. So I'm not saying I re recommend only using heat lamp. In this case, this is just what we use. This is what we used before. We used to use the, the lights, but we found that the birds get neurotic when the light is on all the time. So we tried to make sure that they are on the regular day and night cycle. So we don't keep the light on when it's dark so they get to sleep and then they wake up when the sun is out. So we started using heat lamps instead so it'll provide the heat but not the light so when the sun is out that's when the light comes on and then but the heat is always on especially during winter time when it's cold especially for those of you who are in higher elevation or it might be windy you know it, it, it could be a, a an issue especially when you are getting your chicks when you just got you get your chicks you know chances are they're probably cold from the distance or the travel that they just did. So you wanna make sure they get comfortable um, so they can, yeah, so you can minimize their stress. So you, you wanna make sure you match the heat source with the number of chicks, you know. Is it on the list? Okay, too hot or not enough will create unnecessary stress. Let's look at this picture. Oops, sorry, sorry. So sensitive. Okay, when it's too cold, I'm showing that picture on the upper left. They try to crowd out, crowd the heat source. And this is where piling up can happen. I've lost a lot of chicks in this scenario. I, we would, you know, we used to live in Pupukea, a little bit higher elevation would come in. I, st I had heat. But because they're crowding out the heat, there was too much birds in there. And then, you know, the next day or the, that morning, the next morning we come in and, you know, it looks okay. And then you start to notice there's like chicks underneath. And next thing you know, there's like crazy amount of chicks dead because oh. they pile on each other. And then on the um, upper right, it's too hot. You know, they get away. You know, that's an indication that, you know, maybe you should turn off the, the heat source. <laughs> uh, or if it's too drafty, they'll go away from where the draft is coming from. That's not a... In fact, we, we lost a lot of chicks recently because of the draft. It was so windy. I had just moved the brooder box location and they were not... I thought they were pretty covered, but I was wrong. So create significant loss. And then the picture on the right, on the bottom right, is just right. At some point, you know, you might not need the heat. I mentioned earlier, you know, we don't use heat lamp anymore. I don't recommend you do that until you're comfortable with your operation. You know, we've been doing this for nine years, and half of those, we always use a heat source or a heat lamp. Um, to keep the chicks the chicks warm um yeah we did a lot of stupid stuff some were not so stupid they paid off but for the most part every time i tell people that they look at me like you're dumb you know so i don't want to teach that stuff so yeah i want you guys to be successful so, so you you just said that you don't use a heat lamp or you do i don't anymore don't anymore okay but that's because you're good at it no no it's not no we we do other things 
and I'll show you what we do um, in the next few slides. But I don't suggest that that you do that off the bat because, like I said, I don't want to say we know what we're doing, but we've done enough, you know, to justify right. why we do what we do. But okay. for, for you guys just starting off, having a heat source or a heat lamp is the best way to go. Yeah. Okay. So just use this picture as a reminder or give you an idea. So that way, like, hey, what's going on? Why are they behaving this way? And then, you know, this could be like a litmus, litmus test, I guess. Or a, Yeah, they're a body language, yeah. Right, right. And we'll actually even talk about that too later on on some of the classes. You know, obviously they can't communicate with us. You know, they don't speak English. They speak chicken. So best way to you know is observing right so their behavior know. right so so yeah all right so the box itself oops sorry a cardboard box will suffice you know if you're getting less than 10 or maybe a little over 10 you know the box size should be proportionate to the amount of chicks you don't want to you know, like in this picture, you don't want a really big box and then you only have, you know, 10 chicks. It's too big. Then you got to heat up the whole area or otherwise you'll crowd into that where the heat source is. And then you're just creating draft. You know, the only thing with, you know, having a brutal box that is homemade, like a cardboard box, I should say, you know, you need to put more care and attention to it because... Yeah, I don't know if you can see it on that upper left corner, you know, the water and the feed, the water and the feeder are on ground level or same level as the the bedding. So chances are there's already debris in that water or their feed. Um, so not ideal. So I would suggest putting propping it up. Oh, the other thing is if you are using a brutal box set up like this, don't use shavings as your bedding. Shavings, pine shavings especially, don't absorb water or the doo-doo. It'll just, well, actually, no, it'll soak it up and it'll just stay there. Not ideal condition. If you are to use something like this, I would suggest you use pellets. You can buy those absorbent pellets, you know, by the time you take out the chicks, then they would have, what's the word? They would have broken down, I guess. But yeah, pretty, pretty better, better than shavings for sure. Don't use sawdust off the bat as bedding because they will eat the sawdust or even the pine shavings, you know, they have uh, small particles there. That's the other reason why you don't want to use that because they might eat that and they can't process the shavings, the wood shavings that can cause health issues. So, yeah, so don't use that. Um, I think this setup is inside. So obviously if you're using something like this, you don't want it outside. You know, you want to protect this setup, you know, from predators and from the elements. Again, chicks are vulnerable at this stage in their life. So you want to make sure that you provide, you know, um, the care that they need. Okay. For long-term use, it may be worth investing or building a reusable, cleanable box. Um, we actually looked at buying something similar as the one on the left. Um, about three, $400. The sucky part was shipping. Costs more to ship. So sure. we... I I built I built my own something sim not similar to the one on the right but that's too fancy I don't have that kind of skill. How long do chicks typically stay in the brooder box? Am I the only one here? Okay. Oh. Welcome back. Ugh. Hi. <laughs> okay, this is another picture of uh, my brooder box. Oops, sorry. I don't know if you can tell, there's a screen right here. It's hardware cloth, half inch, whole size. Um, if I have to do this over, I would use a quarter inch 
Only because when we get the chicks, usually hours after they're hatch, they're okay walking on it. They don't fall through their the feet. I mean, but at night when they they go to sleep, they huddle together to keep themselves warm, and sometimes they push, and their legs get stuck inside or through the through the holes. So a quarter inch hole. A little bit more expensive, but no legs can go through. And a lot of times, by the time I figure or I see that it happens, you know, it's kind of too late. Their their legs is not broken, but somehow it atrophies, and then they can never get it back to work again. And usually, it just leads to them not doing good. And I don't know if you can tell, but on the bottom, I have a, this is plexiglass. I collect the manure because I use it to fertilize my plants. I shouldn't say plants, my trees. You should not use raw manure to fertilize edible plants like lettuce, anything that you would consume raw. Okay, there's, just don't do that. If you're going to use chicken manure for fertilizing, use it on fruit trees, fruit bearing trees that are established. Okay. Even then there's consideration. So just be careful. Well, Christy, did I answer your question? How long did they stay in the brew the box? Um, yeah, up to four weeks for egg laying chicks um, for our meat. Bird, yes. Thank you. Yeah, our, ours is only a week and a half, two weeks the most. Okay, and over here, what I do when I when I set up a brooder, our brooder boxes, um, for meat birds, they do do a lot. The egg laying chicks, not so much, but I use, I put bedding underneath. They're not, it's not on the, so the, the chicks are walking on the hardware cloth. So the doo-doo goes underneath, right? And it's being and it's being mixed with the and this one I, I only had bamboo leaves. Usually I use mulch, but I ran out of mulch. But I use bamboo leaves. Two reasons. When I didn't, the smell was overwhelming. And then two, the ammonia was unmitigated. So it's you know, they're breeding on, you know, the doo-doo smell. So with this bedding, some of it is absorbed. And usually when you're using mulch material, or in this case for me, the bamboo, there's some microorganisms already there. It helps with absorption and also breaking down of the, the manure. So it's not as overwhelming. Yeah, so you don't have to do this. This is, I'm just showing you what we do. Because again, I collect the manure and if it has organic matter like these leaves right here, it hastens the process of breaking down the manure compared to if it was just by itself. And trust me, it stinks. You know, if it sits <laughs> there for like four weeks, three, four weeks, it, it, it can get pretty stinky. All right. Okay. So... Again, this is my setup. There's my feeder. The water is right there. These chicks are there. I laid a cardboard. Again, because they, they're too young, they're, 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 when they sleep at night, they huddle together like how they're doing it now. Their feet can get stuck in between the holes. And then we use... so. I put the cardboard or part of the cardboard box one side on the on the hardware cloth and then I use the other the rest of the cardboard box to cover them. So this is what I use in lieu of a heat lamp because there's so many ticks in there they generate their own heat. It gets trapped through these through this box so the heat doesn't necessarily escape although there's holes so this kind of regulates the heat. Um, I don't recommend you do this unless, you know, after a while of you having experience. Again, because you're not getting, you know, 700 chicks like we do. So if you only have like 15 or 20, they won't generate the same amount of heat as 75 chicks. 
Okay, so that's why I say, you know, use a heat lamp or a heat source <clears throat> to start. You know, when you get to this, again, this is what, you know, we've experimented with this for years. So um, this is something that we've been doing. Anyway. All right. Any question about Bruder boxes? Yeah, there's one question. Can you use other old leaves? Or only bamboo. Nope. You can box. use anything, any 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 brown material. Like I said, I I, only, I use bamboo only because that's what I could get easily. I I had a pile of mulch. I've been trying to get mulch, get the tree trimmer guys to bring mulch to me, but there are easier ways for them to unload it, so they don't want to come see me. So yeah, any 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 brown material will suffice if you want to go that route. Grass clippings, dead leaves, um, yeah, pretty much anything really. Do Do you measure the temperature in the box, or is there an ideal temperature you can aim for? Uh, shoot, that's a good question, and we can ask Doctor Jaw this tomorrow or next week too, but. If I'm not mistaken, in the CAFO, I think they maintain a 92 or 93 degree temperature, which is kind of similar to our body temperature. So you're going for that comfortable temperature, but not too hot. And like I said, not too cold. But you also got to remember the CAFOs are pretty big. And if there's a lot of chicks in there, so they generate heat. So you got to compensate for that. But yeah... Uh, you know, I, I, if I, if I'm not mistaken, it was like 92 or 93. But let's 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 ask Dr. John next week because he worked with big KFO houses in the past, and he'll probably be able to answer that question better than I could. In the past, I you know I'm I'm only and I'm only sharing this because we did it, and I'm not saying you do it. In the past especially during summertime once we pick up the chicks we don't even put them in the brooder box we just take them straight to the field the only thing we make sure is that there's no draft too much draft i should say and for the most part they were okay until it started raining then it became an issue and and once we saw that so a whole I think a year and a half, we were just taking out the chicks to the field as soon as we picked them up. But so when it, a cardboard box would work then out in the oh field? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But like I said, when it rained, then other factors be, come into play, you know, like when it's wet and then even a little sprinkle of or mist get into them, you know, their behavior change. And that's kind of when everything went haywire so we started putting them back in brooder boxes so at least in the brooder box you know you can control those elements from uh, being a factor they're a little bit more protected like i said we don't do that anymore because the mortality rate you know went up significantly so unless you can promise sunny weather every day um you know which is impossible, right? So we don't do it anymore. But like I said, you know, you can use a cardboard box for sure, especially in the beginning stage where you're just trying to figure it out. You know, you're not getting hundreds of chicks at a time. And chances are, you know, when you replace your, your chickens, it's going to take about a year after they start producing when you start considering getting new chicks to replace your current hens. So it, there's, there's a bit of a gap or time for you to figure out how you want to do the, do the brooder box period for the chicks. All right. Any other question? All right. Yeah, like I said, I don't measure the temperature only because I guess of experience. It doesn't work all the time. You know, last month we lost 600, I think. 600 of these chicks died 
There was that sudden drop of temperature, unexpected. And yeah, big lesson learned. Okay. All right, let's talk about coops. Coops offer protection, just like a Buddha box, from harsh elements, weather, predator, predators, and vectors of disease. So hopefully when you consider building your coop, you know, they have those elements where they can offer the same protection. Okay. Essential parts, just like a Buddha box, you need a feeder, a water source. In the case of, by the time you transfer your chicks, um, they will be in that pullet stage and they will need something to roost on. Um, Julius. Yes. When you transfer the chicks, they go in the same cage with the, the other bigger birds that have already been there, our first, our first batch. Or they okay. go in their own area. Um, that's uh that's a great question. You want to match their size. You don't want to put too small of a chickens or too you know like the pullet stage with the hens. They'll bust are, them up. Yeah, they'll bust them up. You guys heard of that pecking order? Yeah. That's literally from chickens. Yeah. From, from yeah, there there is a pecking order. And even within the hens themselves, there is a pecking order. There's a dominant um, hen until there's a mutiny and she gets taken down. I don't know. But there is a pecking <laughs> order. <laughs> but yeah, you don't want the smaller size hens going in with the big, big ones. Um, uh, okay. They will, get, they will get bullied for sure. What do you call the full-grown ones? You have the chicks, the pullets, and then what are the full-grown hens? Yeah. Okay. little simple than cows. <laughs> or hard says no. So the pullets won't be laying when yeah. they're uh, a pullet. Yeah. So, so when they start laying eggs, then they become hens up until the point where... They're not laying, so from chick, and then they become pullets, and then hens. So when they become hens, they will be the same size as the hens, the first batch right. of hens that we've got. And at that point, they go together? You can, yes. There is a way of introducing them. I was told you do it at night when they're asleep. So <laughs> there's no... Infiltrate yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. So slightly sli slide them in. And then they wake up and it's like, okay. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah. <laughs> as opposed to as opposed to like, yeah, during the day and they see it, it's like, oh, who's this? Who's this? And you know uh -oh. <laughs> that whole pecking thing comes into play. Yeah. The power yeah. the power trip or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> we th we thought it was a bunch of croc until we tried it and yeah, it was it was not good. Um, yeah, I've seen it for things. Yeah. A ball of head on the top. <laughs> right. And it's not exclusive on chickens either. Uh, pigs do the same. Horses do the same. I do the uh, same. <laughs> I do the same. <laughs> do yeah. <laughs> Bunch of new people. I'm like, were you? Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then again, protection from harsh elements and predators. And then the other one is nesting boxes, because by this time. You know, you're you're gearing them for laying eggs. So you got to make sure you have nesting boxes. Okay. And we'll talk more about that after. Talk about the coops. So for space consideration, you need at least one square feet per chicken. Okay, minimum. You know, the battery cages, that is out the door. Again, I have nothing against that. It's just, you know, I, I maybe just pick your, picture yourselves being in a tight space, you know. Oh, I know. Yeah, it's, it can get pretty hectic in there. So you give them enough space. You know, it's kind of small. 
But the one on the bottom right, they were, I think the USDA was, were trying to, I don't know if they want to pass a law or just a recommendation to have at least two square, two square feet per chicken. Right now, the recommendation is one square feet, but you know, ideally, ideally you want them to be out, right? But of course, those they have, the, you know, there's limitations there, too. But the more space, the better, if it allows it where you're at. Um, it's kind of a good size. Yes, yes, it is. Twenty five chickens. Yeah. That's so. That's like twenty five. Chickens per square foot, right? One square foot per chicken. One, one, so, one foot per, so 25 square foot. 25. So you need 25 square foot. That's yeah. that's kind of sizable. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, you, you also got to account. So if you're building your coop, so the footprint might be smaller, but if you have, you know, if it's higher and they can roost higher, you know, you, you you can also account for that space, you know. Oh, okay. I I did make a mistake on our second or third batch of chickens that we did for um, the egg layers, at least. The space was a little bit too small. I put, it was like, it was eight feet by 10 feet and I put a hundred of them in there. Yeah, it was a little too small. And the reason I knew it was small is because the, the doo-doo was getting over, uh, well, the microbes in the, on the bedding were uh, getting overwhelmed by the doo-doo. And, and I couldn't mix those chickens with the old one, so I had to. So is, go ahead. I lost my thought. Oh, yeah. Maybe having it tall enough so that they have enough space to roost. Um, on are they all going to roost or some will just stay on the floor? No, for these type of chickens, they will all roost. Whether, depending on the pecking order, they might be, you know, the the top chicken will be on the highest. I, I don't know. Or maybe, and then the if you're the runt, you're on the lowest, you know. Getting uh, shit up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, the first coop that we did, the roost was just one long one. So there's no going high or low. It's all there. And I, I didn't know what the pecking order was. I knew somebody was getting bullied, but oh. that's that's called communism. <laughs> <laughs> Equity. Not so we you need roosting areas that are at different levels. You can't just have like say one long like bar. I mean, like you know, two by circle or something. You know, what am I trying to say? Like a pole. Right. Right. So you, you need various... Um, it, it's not necessary. I think it's just something to consider if the, you know, the coop that you're trying to build has space limitations. Like you can't go wide, but you can go high. Then obviously if, if, it, if, you, if it's, the footprint is a little smaller, you know, if, it can, if from one side to the other can only fit 10 chickens on a, on a roost, then you might want to put more roosts above so that way, you know, the other chickens can go higher. So it just extends your square footage. Right, right. That's, yeah, it doesn't have to be one or many, yeah. Just make sure that everybody has enough space for them to roost. To stretch their oh, wings. Right. They still um, sleep on top of each other. Like the adults... Like I read, you have to have, you know, so much space. And then there's like seven of them in that one space. Summertime, whole thing. I don't know. Right. There's like 100 in my neighbor's mango tree every night. <laughs> Those feral chickens? Yes. And they crow at oh. 9, 10, 11 o'clock p.m. Oh, my God. I'm dead, Nalani. You just made me spit out my water. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and I'm like, can you not hear that? Go shoot them with the water hose, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, so just something to consider. You don't want to pack them in because, you know, like I said, when they're too packed in, behaviors will change. And, yeah, it can get ugly. 
it can get really so, ugly. So I have a question. We're going to start with half of the the intended goal. I think it's fifty, yeah. correct? Right. Yeah. So we're gonna we we need to build for fifty. Is that correct? Or are we gonna build? another coop down the road for tw the other 25 well, yeah you should you should build for 50 or however you want to scale your project okay and you got you're gonna get money for the coop and also the brooder box okay yeah so in, yeah, in mind, the, the roosts it's like a ladder so, um, so something close to a ladder so it just kind of it leans on one side and then the ground and then they just go up and, and it could, it could fit like 80 chickens in my coop, and it's not a very big footprint because of that ladder scenario. Oh, nice. Yeah, you can section it off, too, depending on the footprint, you know, for, for the pullets and for the hens. Actually, no, I take that back. Don't do that. That might cause some problems. All right. Anyway. Neighbors. <laughs> So let's go to movable coops. So I'm going to talk about movable coops and then I'm going to talk about static coops. This one in particular, it's called a chickshaw. It's by abundantpermaculture.com. That's the, their web address. This is Justin Rhodes. He came to our farm many years ago. He did this great American farm tour. And the guy that works for me invited him without telling me well actually he told me but i didn't know who this guy was and i was just like yeah sure whatever and then <laughs> apparently he's a big deal i i didn't know in fact i didn't even watch what he made until later that's pretty cool yeah it was it was, it was rickshaw, like a rickshaw yeah yeah so this one is based on the rickshaw it's like a it's like a wagon that's being pulled, you know, like usually in Asian countries. How like transportation? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And this one can house forty to sixty hens, according to him. Yeah, um, look pretty. And this is a pretty cool design. Again, you know, this I'm just showing this as an example. I'm not telling you this is what you should do. There are many variations or iterations of a movable coop. I just saw this to be the most simplest, at least, just based off of the the design and the pictures. I have not done this. For our chickens, we do a different setup, obviously, because they're meat chickens. I, I don't see it working for meat chickens anyway. But this is a really good idea. But there are many other ideas. Again, just use this because um, it looks cool to me. Okay, and a lot of the parts serves a lot of different purpose. So yeah, so he he can move it by himself. I don't think there's sixty hens in there or forty hens even oh, right no. now. So the the roof is it's, on. Oh, go ahead. This is hard to imagine fitting forty to sixty hens in the right small area. Well, they they go in at night, so they're all in there at night. But what he does is he opens it up, and so the the chickens, the hens can go out and forage, like a pasture right. style. Right. So really, it's just for them. It's just for them to sleep in. Mm. Um, it's not for them to be in it the whole time. Of mm. course, weather permitting, you don't want them out when it's like raining crazy, right? So it's a good. It offers good protection. So yeah, like in this picture, the lid can open up and then he uses the handle to prop up the lid. I thought that was pretty cool. And then there's that door that they can go out. They have, it has two pieces of wood there as, as a ladder. So they can go in and out easily. And he has, <clears throat> he made sure to put nesting boxes inside using milk crates. I thought that was pretty cool. And then they have something to roost on. It looks like one by one. And then it has the hardware cloth underneath as protection from predators. Hardware cloth, I would recommend using as opposed to chicken wire. The hardware cloth will last longer 
it's more durable and hardy compared to the chicken wire. The chicken wire, when was it? Last Saturday or Friday night or Saturday morning, early morning, we got attacked by hunting dogs. Mm. They got in. You know, we used hardware cloth. The damage wasn't too bad. We only lost 14 chickens only because the zip ties were broken so they were able to break in or slide in. But the ones that they did try because, you know, there was enough zip ties, they couldn't penetrate through the hardware cloth. So, so yeah, it's something to consider. It is a little bit more expensive than chicken wire, but, you know, it is durable. A lot of our chicken tractors, since we, we use this, from when we started so I haven't had to replace a lot of them and most of them half at least two-thirds I think if I'm not mistaken are at least eight or nine years old and the hardware cloth is still going so pretty good I have a question sure nesting boxes say I have 25 chickens in my coop do I need 25 nesting boxes no, you don't. In fact, I'll talk about it in after. We'll do okay. the static coop and then we'll go to the nesting boxes. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I have a real quick question as well. Yeah. So what we're looking at in this picture, though, that's chicken wire, right? Yes. Well, that's hard or, cloth. hardware cloth, they that, call that's it. That's called hardware cloth, what's in this picture? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. The chicken wire is... It it's has again, yeah, it's woven, whereas this one is welded. Oh, God. okay, gotcha. I, to me, I call all of this kind of stuff all chicken wire, so good to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and nothing wrong with the chicken wire, but like I said, it's not as durable. It's as this one. It still works if you can keep predators, you know, um, at bay. Um, but just oh, from my experience, yeah, hardware cloth is a little bit more durable yeah no I, I was just saying like i i never really differentiated oh I see. a hardware cloth versus um chicken wire to me they were all kind of like a little fencing of some sort so they all right. fell into the same category i never differentiated well this shape is actually called chicken wire versus this shape is called chicken cloth okay so now i know thank you yeah yeah cool okay okay now let's talk about the static coop. This particular one, they call it the Hubble Bubble because Mike Hubble from KL designed this. It doesn't quite look like this anymore. They updated it. It kind of looks like this. Sorry, I couldn't find the pictures. I still couldn't find the pictures after Tuesday's class. So it's patterned after the Korean natural farming method. There's two. It's not a pitch roof per se. One is higher than the other. So the idea is for the heat to go up and then uh, uh, go out from that opening at the top there. But I also found that, you know, because we're in a subtropical climate, oops, sorry. It, that part, this part is not necessary. You can have a total pitch roof without that opening. If you are going to do something similar like this, you know, there's so much holes and opening that it's fine. You know, it, it, that heat dissipation or that heat going out is not too critical because of where we're at. You know, they designed that or the concept behind this design is for temperate climate. You know, when it gets really, really humid, like in Southeast Asia... You know, you want some of that heat escaping somehow, you know, at the same time, like this design was from Korea. They want to make sure, you know, like when it's cold, when it's snowing, like they can cover the whole walls and then, but they won't, they don't want to trap the heat or too much heat. So it has some way to dissipate or to get out. Okay. I don't know if Annie emailed it to you guys yet, but. I will. Okay, cool. Oops. I won't get into the details of how to build this. That PDF that Annie will send you guys have all the info, even the plans. Same thing with the the chickshaw. 
Again, the website is right there, AbundantPermaculture.com. You don't even have to type the mobile chicken coop. You can click on the link to get to the plants. And he even tells you or list the cut list, what you need to do, and pictures on how to put it together. So same uh, with the Hubble Bubble. Again, this is the old design. This is the new design. And this PDF that was published by the UHC TAR will give you all the info you need. Again, these are, you know, you don't have to copy these, you know, however they're built. It's just to give you an idea or an inspiration. You know, remember the things that we talked about, you know, that you need to consider when you are, you know, putting together your or building your coop. Again, you know, it's all dependent on the lay of your land um, and what works best for you. Um, so, um, and yeah, and if you go online, um, there's so many different ideas or iterations of these two designs. Um, one is not better than the other. It's all about, um, again, the lay of your land um, and all those considerations that you need to think about when you are putting this together. Um, and also, Kalalea emailed the mm. shopping list that he did. He showed us his coop on Tuesday. Maybe we can ask him to take pictures and send it to us. And Yeah, uh, I will. Oh, well, it was really interesting. He was very proud of it, too, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when we first did ours, it was just a tarp tent. It worked until it started raining hard for a long time or for a number of days. And water got in, and it inundated some of the bedding, and that's when we had problems with mites. So we had to change the tarp into a tin roof and divert the water so it doesn't get in. So, so yeah, so we had to make that adjustment. Um, so again, you know, just the considerations for your, for your for your area. So where are these mites? They're just kind of like floating around waiting for a wet bedding uh, or something? <laughs> no, usually they're from the the wild birds. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're like, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Let's go there. Right. Or sometimes, or a lot of times it's from their doo-doo. They're, they can be carriers. It might not be a big deal for them, but, you know, oh. it can be an issue for for domesticated um, oh. uh, chickens. Yeah. Flying mites. <laughs> yep, they have a, they have transportation. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so really important not to get the wild birds. When I say wild birds, the flying birds. Whether it's egret, the minor birds, the pigeons. When I and when I say feral birds or feral chickens, that's that's the chicken outside. Sorry, I should have made that clear. So, so you really got to protect the feed source from pigeons flying in and coming into the, you know, the nesting area from your birds. Yeah. Yeah. So if you pasture your birds, right, you let them out, you know, that's okay. But make sure like the water and the feed. Because the birds usually don't care. The feral or the wild birds don't usually care about the chickens or the hens. They, they're, they're coming because they have something, usually it's feed, that they can mooch off of. And unfortunately, when they come, they bring their baggage with them, whatever huh. that baggage may be. So that's what you want to avoid. So that's going to be in the house, yeah. That's not, it's not going to be outside in their in their their out area. Let's yeah. say the food water is all going to be in the house or somewhere where it's protected. Yeah, in the coop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. It doesn't have to be. Just make sure it's protected, or maybe you're there when it's eating time. I don't know. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, and it's this is something that we can ask Chris to, or maybe even Doctor John next week far as feeding schedule when we fed our hens it's usually in the morning because it was convenient for us and so we try to keep the same schedule 
So whatever makes sense to you. Wow, it's raining. Um, anyway. Okay, any other questions? All right, so nesting boxes. Sorry if it's the rain is too loud. Nice. I'm outside. Actually, even if I'm inside, it's going to be loud anyway. Nesting boxes is a place for hens to lay eggs. It needs to have a buffer or padding so eggs don't break. It needs, actually, it doesn't need to be dark, but it needs to offer privacy for the hens when they lay their eggs. And nesting space, just enough for one hen. Yeah, you don't want them crowding in one big space only because there's potential for them to break the eggs if there's too many in there. One trying to get out, one trying to get in, or them just trying to move around. Really, you're doing, you're just trying to protect the eggs. So that's why you want to make sure your nesting space is just enough for one hen. Sometimes they're trying to fit, they're going to try and, you know, if there's one already there, they're trying to, one will come in and um, force its way in. Um, but yeah, just, just keep an eye. Um, stuff like that happens. Um, so here's an example of a nesting box or nesting area that, that you can buy, ready-made. You don't have to do, buy. You know, there's other ways to do it, or nesting boxes, I should say. Just like the one on uh, uh, Movable Coop, they use milk crates, and they use straw as the uh, padding for the eggs. The only reason I, I put this here, or I, I, I place this picture, or use this picture, is because I like the design of where they lay the egg. So the eggs lay here. If you can see, it's on an angle. The eggs roll down, and it's protected. And then, you know, you can open this to harvest the egg. You know, obviously, the hens are not going to be able to fit in there. So, yeah, I, I just like this. I like this design. That's the only reason I put that there. I'm not advocating for it. But I feel like, you know, this is a, a good design for the purpose of protecting the eggs. Again, just one example. The picture on the left, same concept. What I like about this though is you can access the eggs outside. But you open this lid. I don't know if you can tell the hinges up there. You can open it, harvest the eggs that way. What we found at least when we were doing this, you know, our brooding, our nesting boxes were inside. We use five gallon buckets and we just line them with straw. So when we harvest the eggs, the hens notice and then get, they get very excited. And I want to guess that they get pissed off. They're like, hey, what are you doing grabbing our eggs? You know, so, um, so this setup right here, minimize that. You can slightly harvest the eggs when um, they're not looking. <laughs> Most of the time, you know, they can't see anyway when they're here. It's a little bit dark or it's covered. So you can slyly harvest the egg, make them less excitable or get pissed off. Okay, the one on the right, so similar, except this one is inside the coop. When we had ours, we positioned the, oops, sorry. We placed the 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 tote this is just a oh, what size was this i think it was like a 17 gallon or 15 gallon tote i just cut out the the hole and then it used to be inside and then we placed it outside we placed it outside we cut a hole around the the hardware cloth so the chickens can go in and then we harvest the eggs outside. We don't have to go inside the coop. Just open the lid and then we harvest the eggs. Okay. Something to keep in mind when you are harvesting. You, know, you want to harvest not as soon, but as you, you need to harvest daily. But you want to minimize 
contact with the chickens or with the hens because sometimes hens would want to lay on them thinking that they might hatch and then sometimes maybe we can ask dr ja about this hens peck the eggs and then they eat them or sometimes like there are hens who just peck the eggs just because and there's a crack not necessarily penetrating the egg but obviously you can't sell a crack egg okay so you know can you eat it sure as long as you cook it properly but yeah you just the, mem the membrane is not right broken yeah yeah as long as the membrane is not broken and you want to make sure it's that day's egg not from the previous day or whatever you know you don't want to get sick yeah, um, yeah just <laughs> Inspect it, make sure the membrane is not damaged or penetrated. Um, but yeah, you can definitely cook it or eat it. Just got to make sure you cook it, you know, accordingly. You don't want to eat raw egg. Um, in fact, it's illegal to eat or serve raw egg in Hawaii, if not the most of the states in the nation. But we'll talk about that later, another, another class. So, so this is what this is this is what we use totes. We didn't do any of these fancy nesting boxes. We just used totes. I bought at Walmart, I think, and I saw it online. This was not my idea. Um, I'm not that smart. And then we use straw as bedding. You just gotta keep an eye on that bedding because sometimes they go in and poop in there, or like I said, when if they crack an egg, you know, if it spills over, you don't want to keep it in there because that can be a vector for mites or other diseases you know so you have to clean clean the whole box out if it gets pretty dirty if the, so, yeah if something cracks or yeah. right yeah yeah chances are if it if the egg crack you're gonna have to clean the whole thing yeah that, that's the other reason why i i like um plastic nesting boxes because it's easier to clean as opposed to wood um, oh yeah I'm, I'm not saying you can't do wood just you know something to consider easier to disinfect too with a with a plastic tote as opposed to wood what yeah. would you use as a disinfectant i would just do bleach i shouldn't say bleach sodium hypochlorite <laughs> yeah, <same laughs> <thing. bleach> Clorox. <laughs> just follow the recommended dilution usually what they use for a hospital should be more than adequate for you to disinfect and usually what they use for a hospital is like the least. So like, I think like one tablespoon for like five gallons. I might be wrong. Don't quote me and, on and that. And why would you disinfect? Just in case there's something there that can, you know, transfer to the, because th they're there all the time, right? When they're laying eggs. And remember when they lay the eggs, you know, the vent open up. So they become vulnerable. So if there's doo-doo in there and somehow, even though that's where the doo-doo comes out, but, you know, if, if that, some, some other chicken's doo-doo somehow has something that the other one doesn't, you know, you don't want that transferring to. So is that something um, you should do regularly as a safe practice or, or a, yeah. a best practice? Yeah, especially if, you know, it might not be an issue in the beginning, but I found that when the hens get older, you know, they do doo-doo in there and <laughs> other, other types of behavior happens, you know. So, but yeah, keep it clean. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> that made me laugh. Um, <laughs> here's another design. This is pretty cool too. The obviously this side of the coop the chickens don't get in, but the nesting boxes is behind where the eggs are. This is at an angle, and this is some kind of screen material, or I don't know how do I describe this. Oh, it's the load. Yeah. So they this could be astroturf, you know, like that fake grass material. So they lay their eggs and then they roll down. So not too hard, the eggs won't break, and then you just go back here and collect the eggs. Chickens don't see you, they don't get excited. And the other thing I like about this setup is when it rolls, you know, there's no 
as minimal contact with the chickens already. Whereas in these setup, you know, the chickens can stay in there. And if it just so happened, one of them poop and you have eggs in there. Now you're dealing with poopy eggs. You know, it, 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 it can be an issue, but because when they lay their eggs, there's a protected film, you know, so there's that added protection. But, you know, you just want to minimize due to getting on the eggs. In fact, I think, I don't, shoot, maybe I got to look that up, like the laws. Maybe we'll talk about that when we get to that part. I know some doo doo is okay, but maybe there's a threshold. I don't remember. Well, I'll look it up. But yeah, but also when you're cleaning the eggs or washing the eggs, having doo-doo on them is just added work as opposed to when you're harvesting the chick the eggs and they're already clean. It makes a whole big difference um, if you are going to wash the eggs. All right. I need washing the eggs now. <laughs> <laughs> All that right. cat machine, Annie. Yes. Any questions? That's all the slides I have. Oh, I like that last setup. I have a question. Sure. Why wouldn't you wash your eggs? I mean, they come from a chicken's butt. Right. So that's a really good question. So there's, I think there's only seven countries in the world, but don't quote me on that. But there's only a handful of countries in the world that don't, that wash their eggs. So I'm just going to use UK as an example. They don't wash their eggs. The idea being when the chickens lay the egg, there's a membrane that is coating the egg. Or I shouldn't say a, a membrane, more like a film that coats the egg. So the idea is it's the egg is protected because of that, that film. So it can sit you know, outside on the table, well, I shouldn't say outside, on the table inside for a certain period of time, you know. So, yeah, so, so that's the idea. And so also because you, they don't wash the eggs, it, it forces the farmer to be diligent in making sure that the eggs don't get pooped on. Because if you get pooped on, even if there's a membrane there, you don't want to sell a poopy egg, right? Now, why do we wash eggs in the U.S.? And this is my personal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because of CAFOs. You know, when you're doing a big operation like that, it's hard to maintain a very sanitary housing system. So, you know there is potential contamination, right? You know, when you're dealing with like thousands and thousands of chickens and them laying eggs. So they wash the eggs, one, you know, to get rid of any fecal matter or doo-doo. But when they do that, they're also washing away the, the film that's supposed to protect the egg. So they actually take it a step further and they spray it with a... A disinfectant solution okay so so the idea being because not everybody is the same is not not everybody's on the same level as far as health is concerned personal health so you know somebody who's raised in a farm exposed to these kind of things will probably have a better immune system that can deal with you know uh, these things as opposed to like, you know, somebody who live in a city, protected and or live in a bubble, you know, not exposed to, you know, the same elements as somebody who's exposed in a farm or lives in a farm, you know, so their immune system might be compromised or I shouldn't say not compromised, but not as well prepared or can handle, you know, so they want to just offer equal protection, I guess. So there's the arguments of, you know, why it should be washed and then there's also arguments of why it should be not washed and so does that apply to the same as refrigerating and not refrigerating eggs right so when you wash the eggs you take out that 
protective material or film. Okay. Um, USDA requires that you refrigerate the eggs. Again, because the egg shell is porous. So if it is left outside, you know, potential contaminants can penetrate the porous material and can, you know, potentially contaminate the, the part that we eat. And, and, and the reason they, they want to protect that part is because there is a threshold as far as bacterial propagation in protein material like meat or eggs, for example. Once you reach that, once, once you cross over that threshold, meaning say, for example, the egg can only handle five units of bacteria. If it goes beyond the five units of bacteria, the only way you can kill those bacteria if, if, is if you char the whole thing, which is, you know, make it inedible, right? You can't eat it anymore. Um, so because the way we cook eggs, you know, sometimes you want it runny, sometimes you want it scrambled. You don't want to cross that threshold because, uh, it, you, you know, you can make people sick. You can make yourself sick. Does that make sense? I don't know if I just started jabbering there. Or I don't know if that answered your question. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> so yeah, so in the United States, everybody is always erring on the side of caution. Sometimes too much, but that's the reasoning. They just don't want to get sued. So they kind of overreach sometimes, you know. But I know we're in uh, New Zealand and the eggs are just outside. I'm like, oh, wow. Right. Interesting. In Tahiti, they're just outside. It's like, okay. And they're like, no, mom, it's safe, safe to eat. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. If I get um, so stomach. <laughs> but no. Yeah, it, I, I leave mine on the counter. Yeah? Um, yeah, the, from, my, from my chickens. And when I still them, them. I don't want to wash them. I don't. Like, if I get well, them in the store, I put them in the fridge. But... Like I wash them directly before I use them just in case I do something oh, yeah. and weird, you know, but yeah. I can tell you, my husband worked at one of the stores here on Kauai, one of the bigger ones. And he I said, they, they don't keep them in. Yeah. They don't keep them in. <laughs> don't tell us that. <laughs> no, for real. My husband was like, it doesn't have to be in the refrigerator. And I was like, yeah, it does. And he was like, hello, all the years I work at such and such. He was like, the, the eggs are never in the refrigerator. They just sit in the back. I was like, are you kidding me? He was like, no. So, yeah. Well, it's probably cool, right? It's probably air conditioned, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, so is it really coming out of the butt? Yes. It's oh. the only vent out. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's the only hole. <laughs> well, so it's a different, it's a different path. But the hole is the same. Yeah. Okay. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll have Doctor John in and if he doesn't go over it. Um, I debone the chicken almost every single day, and I'm looking, and I'm like, okay, it's got to be another. It's got to be another avenue. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 and, the same vent hole. And that will intro to our anatomy class for next week. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good segue for sure, yeah. But yeah, in the United States, we have to wash eggs. So be careful who you sell your eggs to if they're not washed, you know. Partly because you don't want to get in trouble if, you know, those people are chatty catty or whatever, you know. Um, not, not that anything's wrong with that. You just don't want to, you know. Uh, and we're going to cover uh, washing, yeah. Yes, um, yes, yes. I, yes. Should, yes. I should mention that my son is one of the food inspectors and he works for the state here on the island of Kauai. Oh, cool. Yeah. Better be on it. <laughs> yeah, be good. One last whatever. I know we're over, but so one of the big egg producers over here on Oahu, they told me a story a few years ago. They said, because they ship to neighbor islands and if the truck that they use is not refrigerated at the docks or the dock worker would not take their eggs. They made that mistake once and they couldn't get on the shipment. And, you know, they said, hey, your eggs are, you know, not in refrigerated containers. So we're not going to take those. And so they had to <laughs> take them back. And, you know, so, yeah, so just something to think about. 
I know uh, sometimes we can get a little lackadaisical with some things, but um, yeah, because you, you never know if somebody's an inspector or whatever, and they'll be like, ah, what's going on? Because we there was a few times I got called for help because the health inspectors saw what they were doing and they were like, oh, what should we do? And I was like, yeah, you shouldn't be doing that, you know, kind of thing. So anyway, just something we want to <laughs> consider. But, but that's all I have. Uh, but if you have any questions and you guys want to stick around, I'm cool. Always very a pleasure.